Welcome to our panel on Lee Kuan Yew. Uh, our theme for this whole conference, as you know, has been leadership. And uh, it may seem odd to have an entire panel devoted to somebody who is no longer with us. Lee Kuan Yew, as you all know, died in 2015. Um, but I think it's not a hard argument to make that he was one of the most uh, outstanding and uh, solicited leaders in Asia in the modern era. Everybody who went to Asia would try and stop in Singapore and see Lee Kuan Yew, um, as long as they didn't have a cold, because I know he didn't like to meet people who had colds. He was quite uh, punctilious about that. Um, but I have with me two excellent interlocutors, uh, Graham Allison uh, from Harvard, who is, uh, has his own book on Lee Kuan Yew with Robert Blackwell. And uh, Shashi Jayakumar has also got a book uh, which he edited uh, on, on Lee Kuan Yew. Um, and I'd like to just start first, Graham, tell me, uh, how did it come about that you got so interested in doing a book on, on Lee Kuan Yew? What was the genesis of that? Well, it's a long story, so I'll just try to give, Make you, short. give you the short version. So I had the good fortune to meet Lee Kuan Yew in 1968. Well, I was a graduate student. He gave himself a three-month sabbatical at Harvard and came and lived there. And uh, I was his walker. He was a visiting fellow at the Institute of Politics. Dick Neustadt was one of my mentors. And he said, will you go collect them and bring him over to you know, the coffee or bring him to here, whatever. So I got a time to spend some time with him and regarded him as a remarkable character then. He was trying to build a new country. And he was just you know, five or six years into the project. And the idea that he's going to take a sabbatical to go back to Harvard to recharge his batteries and whatever, pretty wild idea, but he was engaged with people everywhere. And then I had a chance to see him every couple of years, you know, after, after that. So uh, I, 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 in the book, the little book that I did with Blackwell, it's a great book, I think, uh, in the sense that 90% of all the words are Lee Kuan Yew words. So we basically had the idea to put the questions and then capture his nuggets, because he had a great capacity for answering an issue or making a point in a very pithy and pointed, often provocative fashion. So you can, as somebody else, I was at an event a couple of weeks ago, and somebody said, this book is so fantastic. I said, well, thank you very much. They said, you know, I regard it as bathroom reading. So I thought, wait, wait a minute, so what is that? He said, you keep it in the bathroom, and then you can just open it up, because you can open up to any chapter, the future of India, or the future of Islamic extremism, or the future of, you know, whatever. Each chapter is just 15 pages, so you got the questions and you got the answers. And he said, I just read a little bit and I learn something, because you cannot pick up any page or two of the book with the questions and get the answers and not say, whoa, whoa. So we call the book, actually, The Grand Master, uh, Lee Kuan Yew on the future of China, the U.S., and the world. And I think it's literally true that uh, I've, I've had a chance to see most of the serious uh, thinking you know, leaders over some now decades. I haven't seen uh, but two who are grandmasters in strategy, and that's Lee Kuan Yew and Kissinger. Yeah. Interesting. Um, interesting that he would go to Harvard for three months while he was prime minister. You wouldn't consider taking Donald Trump for three months? We, 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 we <laughs> you don't be, have to answer He would be welcome. Uh, so let me just put a footnote about that because it just it shows what a remarkable character this guy was. Here, he's just, they haven't succeeded for sure. I mean, there's is a very, I'm, I'm sure you'll tell us more, you know, the, about details. But uh, he, he thought that he had to understand what, what were the main, main currents in the world. And as he says in his own biography, uh, Ray Vernon, who was a professor at the business school, who was at the time just getting his head around what we now think of as globalization and multinational corporations, was a big impact influence on him. Yeah. Who was kind of he was getting the big themes, and then lo and behold, in Singapore, he decided we'll create an environment. All these multinational companies will come, uh, and uh, it worked. It worked. Yeah. Shashi, uh, your dad was foreign minister and in government for a long time. Uh, you've been in government. Um, and you spent a lot of time with Lee Kuan Yew. Give us a sense of what he was like, I really is in a later career, but give us a sense of what Lee Kuan Yew was like as a leader, even after he left uh, the Prime Minister's post. Sure, just uh, briefly the background. Um, I was seconded out of government public service to work on a book with Lee Kuan Yew, with, with others that became one man's view of the world. It's well worth reading. It's the summation of his uh, foreign policy thinking. 
that was like doing a mini MBA. So one week he wants to talk about China, I have to do the brief, what he's ever said about China, what agencies said, what his friends have said, what China says and so on. He reads the brief and then that plus the transcription, the interviews, and for China it went on for weeks, just that country becomes the core kernel of the chapter of, of, of that particular book. Um, tremendously uh, intellectually curious, and if I can just go back to Harvard here, it's very, very interesting that uh, two and a half, three years after Singapore's independence, where Singapore's independence is no, by no means guaranteed, secured, he chooses to do a sabbatical, not just any sabbatical, a sabbatical at the place he feels is the future driver of the world polity, world growth, because if you look at his emotional academic attachment, it's not to the US, it's actually to, to the UK, Fitzwilliam yeah, College, Cambridge. Cambridge. He decides not to do this and he go to Harvard, and uh, Prof. Allison can correct me, I think it's at Harvard that he meets some of the future great uh, geopolitical thinkers, I mean, yourself obviously, but also some Huntington and Henry Kissinger, I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong. So that becomes very, very important to him to track back to your question in terms of learning from the, the greatest minds, the ones who really have pragmatic, important things to say, uh, I've never seen anyone uh, who's a better exemplar than, than he is, even in his, in his old age. And it's not for by accident that uh, Peter Ho, the former head of Singapore Civil Service, has called Mr. Lee uh, a one-man intelligence agency, because he really was that. Uh, interviewing him from 11 to 13, you got a sense of the, the, the sheer scope of his, of his mind which is why the 20 volumes of his collected papers, I don't advise you to buy this, get it at a, at a library, show the sheer amount of time he actually made, not just for statesmen, but for ordinary journalists. You know, I suspect that it's a deep, sparring instinct within him where he gets something out of the exchange. So some of the best things in the 20 volumes are actually not with other statesmen, but with like Farid Zakaria and, and, and this kind of thing. He wants to know, particularly in his older age, where he doesn't have the energy to go out and find out what makes polities ticks, he wants people to come to him. The sheer amount of time he makes for everyone, low, high ranking, so long as you have something interesting to say, he'll make time for you. And I think it's in your book where he talks about how it's actually more valuable to spend time with one smart person who's read a whole bunch of books and you can distill their knowledge in a 30 minute or an hour interview as opposed to reading all the books they read, which will take you years and years. A very interesting approach to how do you get knowledge. You find the smartest people and talk to them rather than go to the library. Well, the Singaporean who attended this last year, Bilhari Kosikan, who's a friend of yours, would be able to give you a uh, illuminating, sorry, I'm, I'm quoting him, but he as a junior country officer gets uh, questions from the prime minister's office in the early days and he answers them directly, this is before email, you know, without realizing this is heresy, that the, the powers that be in the Foreign Affairs Ministry will come down really, really hard on him. That's not how you do it. You write the minute, the memo gets vetted up three or four levels. That doesn't happen. You have a ding-dong between young Bilahari, country officer, and, and Lee Kuan Yew. But he allows this to happen, the big man, because he's convinced that hey, this guy, I don't know who he is, just a small fry, he's got something interesting to say. He's a smart smart guy. And this happens time and time again if you look at the files internally which I have in, in the archives. The number of times Lee Kuan Yew wants something done, he doesn't go to the minister or the permanent secretary, he goes down right to that small digit in the intelligence service or whatever, the foreign ministry, the guy who actually knows the stuff, the up and coming guy. And that guy's career is marked from then on. The number of people who are in that situation who later become the top ranking guy, that's extraordinary. Now I get you a moment Graham, but I just want to pursue that point because Lee Kuan Yew, there's a strain to him which is, is, is kind of almost on PC. He has a great respect for talent, but impatience for people who are not smart. He, he discarded people very quickly if he didn't think they were worth it. Um, and in that example you give, I mean, Bill Harry is a very smart guy and he spotted his talent very early on. But, but he has this sense that there are a small number of people in this world who were born, and he does think that they were born, genetically well predisposed to rule, to be smarter, and the rest not and your task is to find the smart people, work with them, and you know, try and be nice to the rest, but don't waste your time with people who aren't there. It's a slightly odd strain to his personality, or, or no? This plays out in a number of different ways. So in the, the earlier years, up to the 80s, you would probably want to call it eugenics, because that, that's what it was. I know. didn't use that word, but yeah. Yeah, uh, where he encourages, encourages graduate mothers to have kids and places disincentives for all the others. And there was sort of a, I wouldn't call it a revolt, but widespread uh, dissent against this, including from some within the 1980s political leadership. He probably, in my view, felt this almost towards the end, but he was forced to downplay this for pragmatic, uh, socio-political considerations. But the other, perhaps more interesting way this plays itself out, he's interested in knowing what makes the winners tick. 
So someone, some grad student one day will write a really interesting paper, paper about the books that Lee Kuan Yew read. But I can give you a couple of examples, you know. The book written about uh, um, what made the, the NASA astronauts, those involved in, I think, Apollo 13, successfully come back. What trained them, how they had the right stuff, how precisely their, their training clicked, clicked, clicked into gear. But there are all kinds of obscure references in his writings to him being fascinated by memoirs of concentration camp survivors, for example. How were those, why some perished and why some made it through? The guy you expect least likely, based on his makeup, who actually made it through and survived and later thrived in later life. He was fascinated by this kind of writing. But if I, if I jump Please. in on this, because I think uh, we have a chapter in the book on uh, leadership yeah. and Lee Kuan Yew. So Lee Kuan Yew uh, loved uh, saying to you, you know, he would say, say something and you would just gasp almost, you know, you're, what, you can't say that? And he would say, he said this more than once, young man, my objective is not to be politically correct, just to be correct. Okay? So he had a, a, a core concept that genes matter and no apologies about it. He said, you know, you might as well, uh, if you, if you ha have a sheepdog, uh, the sheepdog can do things that an ordinary dog can't do. And to try to get an ordinary dog to, to herd the sheep, this was not going to make any sense. So he, he sorted people in terms of what he thought was their core capabilities. He thought that was essential for trying to build a meritocracy. He didn't think that you should just have a... Uh, uh, he thought that actually for a society to work, you had to have a class of almost philosopher kings. He never articulated his political theory as well. I tried to get him actually once to say, you know, you should just write down how this, how you think this political theory works because he spent a lot of time uh, weeding uh, to find who were the talents and promoting them through the system in Singapore. And if you look at the ministers, it's an extremely impressive group of people. I mean, a lot of them I know because they've been Kennedy School students. So you look at them, they could compete in any world, anywhere, any, any place, any time. And they hold them to performance criteria. I remember once the Minister of Education out there had come to visit, had been a student, and he said, you know, uh, I, I'm coming up on my test because uh, they're going to do this general, I can't remember, some kind of inter, international test. And he said, uh, uh, the deal is if the lowest 20% in Singapore who are disproportionately Malay don't perform better than the average student in Boston, I get fired. <laughs> And this guy said, oh, gee, that's pretty tough. He said, no, it's actually not very difficult. <laughs> um, you have an interesting uh, uh, question in your book, which you asked him, which were, um, what are the most common mistakes that leaders make? And his reply was twofold, and it was very interesting. The first is more obvious, which is hubris, overconfidence, leaders get bigger beyond themselves. But the second one was, a big mistake for a leader is to miss a transformative opportunity when you're presented with it. And that to me is kind of, that's the Lee Kuan Yew afterburner. You can say, yes, leaders shouldn't get too big for their pants, but, but the, the second part I thought was very interesting. Can you talk, do you remember when he said that? Yeah. Yes, uh, the, uh, yes. Okay. he thought that uh, on the one hand, uh, he didn't seek the opportunity with his two buddies, Roger Rotnan and Dr. Go, to try to build a country. But once they determined to do it, they decided, okay, how often do you get a chance to do this? Let's see what we can do, let's see what can be done. He then would look where there were opportunities. So he was quite uh, uh, taken, and the reason why he and Kissinger were the two closest intellectual soulmates of each other uh, for strategic opportunities, just what you're saying. So he was very impressed with the Kissinger-Nixon opening to China that provided part of the context for both Vietnam, the uh, closing of Vietnam and the, uh, and the, the uh, widening of the gap between China and the Soviet Union in the Cold War. Uh, and uh, 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 so he, he, if you look at the chapter on the future of India, you can see the same thing. He thought that Indira Gandhi finally had the chance to make India a real country, as he would think of it, uh, after the assassination of her son, when there was a big outpouring and she had a fan. So he went to her and he said, you know, now is the time when India can become a great country. 
And, uh, and then he explains it. She says, well, you know, uh, uh, no this, no this, no this. He says, well, I concluded that India is just going to be India and it's never going to you know, manage to become the country that it could be. So he'd like to find strategic opportunities. He would even, he wouldn't go, or I don't know enough of the history whether he would go and tell somebody about it, but he would certainly watch and listen. Part of the reason why uh, virtually every leader in the world, just as you said before, wanted to go see Lee Kuan Yew. And every Chinese leader from Deng Xiaoping called him mentor was because he did have this strategic sense for what was going on in the situation and able to help other people identify opportunities. Um, Shashi, in your book, you talk about uh, his views on leadership, countries, uh, many countries around the world blessed with resources, with strong historical traditions, so on and so forth, which floundered because of lack of leadership. And here's Lee Kuan Yew building a country in the most unlikely place. Singapore is a rock. It doesn't even have its own water. It has to pipe its water in from Johor. Um, that's an interesting, interesting view of, of, of leadership as something that, that without, without a leader, it doesn't matter all the, all the ingredients, you're never going to make the cake, right? I think he would have been uh, expe accepted the, 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 the term leader. But I can't forbear but to add that once when he was called to his face by a journalist statesman, he said that anyone who considers himself a statesman ought to see a psychiatrist. Yes, exactly. He, he never believed in that kind, that kind of hubris. But, you know, to invite in, as Prof. Allison has alluded to, uh, MNCs, in uh, decolonizing the 1960s, where the prevailing trend was very much left, it was against this kind of, of movement. And as the UNDP was very keen to point out in, in those days, in Asia, the societies and states which were going to make it were Sri Lanka, Myanmar, the Philippines, right? And in those days, Philippines had a top-notch system. Look what happened to, to them. So the deal that he presents to the Singapore people, and by the way, as you said, we had nothing. We had been chucked out of Malaysia. No one really thought we would make it. The Malaysian leaders thought we would come crawling back by the late 60s, early 70s. The deal he gives to the Singapore people is, says, look, do everything that I say. Sacrifice some of your personal liberties, I guarantee you, you will have a future and not just that, an uplift for the succeeding generation for your kids. At that time, that's a deal that the Singapore people were willing and able to take. And a, a notion of social compact, which existed probably right up to the late 80s, early 1990s, now it started to fray somewhat because the millennials want, want more than that, I guess. So that would be a challenge for the next generation. Now, I know we're running out of time, so I'm going to take a couple of questions from the floor. I could do this forever, but um, please. I visited uh, Singapore a couple of months ago and went to a museum and watched his uh, videos. He's a terrific speaker and reminded me of the great communicator, President Reagan. So how his uh, public speaking abilities helped him to rally the masses, the people, and inspire them to With go that deep to voice, the right? If you have had the chance to, thank you for the question, to go back to his earlier speeches where, because he was not just Lee Kuan Yew, he was Harry Lee to his closest friends, an Anglophile. And as I think Anthony Eden or someone else once said to him, the best bloody Englishman east of the Suez. So his style had to change rapidly in the 1960s. He has to master English with a, a Singapore intonation and Malay, he knows some, not much, learn Chinese from scratch learn the dialects from scratch, yeah? And that becomes very, very important to him because there's a powerful left-wing communist-inspired opposition presence who is adept at, at campaigning in these kinds of languages. So it's a tremendous personal uh, effort for him. And in instructive in this is the decision later to make all Singaporean Chinese just learn Chinese. You do away with the dialects. It was something he was very, very strong against, which caused a lot, a lot of uh, uh, discomfort against? With, against dialects. He effectively killed off dialects. They're making something of a comeback now, but that, that, that's a separate story. So to each various slice of the Singapore demographic to communicate in their tone, their tenor, their intonation, and in what appeals to, to, to them, what can emotionally sway them, yes, he could do that. In, in fact, without that, he would not have succeeded. And we can have a long discussion about the various language coaches and, and instructors he, he employed in the various languages because they helped him too. One other footnote on that, because it's a great question. I mean, he decided we're going to have English as the first language. I think, what? 
I mean, this is the people that speak Chinese, there's people that speak Indian, there's people that speak Malay, there's people that speak dialect, he's English, why? Because he thought English was the language of, that become the international, the lingua franca, which of course it did. And indeed, I say in the book, uh, uh, at one stage, and he tells about this, he tried to persuade a Chinese leader when they were trying to march to the market to make English the first language in China. He said, of course, that didn't go very well. It was a short conversation. Uh, let's have one more question and then, uh, then we'll go. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Rebecca. Uh, thank you for the very insightful discussion. My question is about, so we've heard a lot about what made this work, right? The personal um, knowledge, depth of strategy, character of Lee Kuan Yew, right? This model of governance in Singapore. Yet, on the other hand, you say, right, that there was a social contract, right, that he made a promise to the people that if they follow him, these results will be achieved. And he delivered on that promise. Now, the curious thing is that if you look at many, let's call them, well, not authoritarian, let's say strong leaders, um, they all promise the same thing. That's the curious thing. They all say, if you follow me and you give away some of your liberty, we will deliver. Yet historically, it doesn't seem like it always works. I would argue that many times it doesn't, or even most times. So was Lee Kuan Yew aware that his example, or to what extent he thought is something that could be replicated? In other words, does Lee Kuan Yew model work without a Lee Kuan Yew? Thank you. Just before they answer that, in your book, Bilahari Kausikan was tasked with motivating the foreign minister in Singapore to find out what do we do when Lee Kuan Yew goes. And the only answer they could come up with was, let's have more Lee Kuan Yews. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. But is the, the, uh, I pressed him on this because I said, there is a Singapore model, and there's the theory of the case. There's an a extreme, ruthless meritocracy, uh, a very severe you know, competition, a concept that the difference between the people who are the best and the people who are the average is like a normal distribution and you're only looking for the tails of the distribution and then to pursue it rel relentlessly. And we, it is a well-known fact in political theory that the benevolent, democ a benevolent dictatorship would be the best form of government except for the fact that it doesn't say benevolent. So historically, mostly these turn out to become kleptocracies or, uh, and that's the, that would be the historical record. So he kept saying, no, there's no Singapore model. We're not gonna propose a Singapore model. We just are happy that it's working here. But in fact, I think that he, he certainly had a theory of the case. Shashi, one final thought on that? On a limited level of cooperation, particularly in the economic sphere, maybe in China, the Suzhou uh, Industrial Park and various industrial parks which have been uh, created in Vietnam, India, yeah, maybe. I don't think he believed in the replicability or transferability of a, of, of a Singapore model. And in fact, this is part of the DNA of the Singapore technical cooperation enterprise, where when other developing uh, third world countries want to come, we'll tell them what the model is. And partly the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy is about that to share the dynamics of the Singapore success story, but we're very, very careful. We don't presuppose that the Singapore model can, can work in, in other countries. We're Paul Kagame is probably the closest in Rwanda. Yeah. I know he's Rwanda modeled himself in the Kuan Yew. He's, he's, he's starting to go in your direction a little but, bit. But even for Rwanda, we have made it a point not to preach to them. That's good. That's good. Um, I'm sorry we have to end this. This is a fascinating subject, but so glad you could come. The next panel here is on Sh uh, Shinzo Abe uh, in Japan and his leadership issues. And then the Hollywood China panel is still going on across the hall. Thank you so much, Graham. We're going to hear more from you later. And thank you so much. Thank you.